For West Indians bristling under British rule, the outbreak of World War I in July 1914 was another sting of salt in the wound. As loyal subjects of the British Empire, many young men, eager to join battle, had rushed off to London to volunteer their services against the combined might of Germany and Austria-Hungary. But to their shock, the War Office in London was hostile. West Indians were outraged by the rejection and discrimination. With West Indian anger rising across the British West Indian Islands, the Colonial Office opened discussions with the War Office. Finally, with open support from King George V, an agreement was made to raise a West Indies contingent. In October 1915, just over a year after the war had begun, the British West Indies Regiment was established with volunteers from all over the West Indian colonies. Out on the battlefield, West Indian illusions of equality were quickly shattered. They expected to fight, and they were made to do menial jobs, wash clothes, peel potatoes, that sort of thing. To a significant degree, the shared experience of humiliating disrespect and denial sharpened the political consciousness of the West Indian soldiers and inspired a regional solidarity among them. After the war, several returned home to lead movements demanding economic and social reforms. Representation in the political system, West Indian unity and self-government. There was this elite group of sergeants who were well-educated men, mature men who had served for much of the war, and they certainly went back to their respective territories with a political mission. We know that was the case. And they were certainly very active in labor and political agitation in places like Jamaica, British Honduras, as it then was, and um, Barbados, Grenada, Trinidad. Um, so the war made a huge difference, and the returning soldiers, particularly the NCOs, I think were well poised to be part of the leadership of post-World War I political agitation. Arthur Cipriani threw his energies into organizing a strike among dock workers. And then in 1919, once again, the dock workers in Port of Spain, the dock workers in Scarborough, the sugar workers, all of them, again, rising in revolt just after the war. The British had promised them that if you go and you fight for us abroad, Indians and blacks join the British West India Regiment, and when you come back, life will be different. And when they came back, life was in fact worse. Forced to respond, the Colonial Office in London sent out a royal commission headed by E.F.L. Wood to engage the lobby for greater representation. In 1924, the Wood Commission's report recommended the introduction of elections to Trinidad and Tobago, limited to minority representation by minority vote. By the 1930s, with the forces of change growing more insistent and ever more radical, Uriah Butler, another survivor of the British West Indies Regiment, moved to the forefront as leader of the working class. He says, Capital and labor must form a marriage. And in that marriage, capital must be subjected to the reason of labor. By 1937, the British West Indian Empire was spinning out of colonial control. Its population spilling out into the streets, demanding more and better. Among their leaders were several veterans of the British West Indies Regiment. Within months, Britain itself was caught in a second devastating world war. The situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted and no people or country could feel itself safe had become intolerable. 
By the end of the war, the writing was on the wall for Britain's Age of Empire. All that remained to be settled were the terms of separation. On July 1st, 1946, the dream of self-government, so dearly cherished by members of the British West Indies Regiment, moved closer to reality. As the people of Trinidad and Tobago went to the polls in the first ever election held under universal adult suffrage. Uriah Butler, veteran of the regiment, put his hat in the ring as a candidate for North Port of Spain, but lost to the popular Albert Gomes. Four years later, in the 1950 election, he entered the Legislative Council as the member for St. Patrick West. Twelve years later, in 1962, the dream became reality as the colony of Trinidad and Tobago evolved into the independent nation of Trinidad and Tobago.